In this lecture, we will explore the relationship between capitalism as project and process on the one hand, and the unfolding climate catastrophe on the other. The lecture will be structured around two main questions in relation to a host of core readings on the topic. The two questions are, one, is it right to blame capitalism for climate catastrophe? And two, what would fending off climate catastrophe require? The core readings which we will review in order to bring these questions into focus include a long two-part essay by Jason Moore, one of the most influential voices in the so-called world ecology paradigm. Moore's world ecology perspective will be supplemented, its intersectional credentials reinforced by Johanna Aksala's article on feminism, capitalism, and ecology, and by Francois Vergès's essay on racial capitalist scene, respectively. The overt anti-capitalism and perhaps especially the centering of capitalism interpreted or diagnosed as the driving force underpinning climate catastrophe will then be critically interrogated through a consideration of Depeche Chakrabarti's polemical rejoinder, the politics of climate change is more than the politics of capitalism. We will then turn to consider the obstacles to addressing the climate crisis within capitalism as laid out by the head of policy and advocacy at the UK based organization, Global Justice Now, Dorothy Guerrero, who provides unabashedly anti-systemic prescriptions in the limits to capital of capitalist solutions to the climate crisis. Finally, and crucially, the issue of what is to be done will be further addressed through attention to Lola Seaton's overview in Green Questions of recent debates in the New Left Review around tactics and strategies for mitigating climate catastrophe. Rethinking capitalism in the web of life. As Wikipedia defines it, the label World Ecology stands for a global conversation of academics, activists, and artists committed to understanding the human relations of power, production, and environment making in the web of life. The World Ecology approach is unified by a critique of nature-society dualisms, a world historical interpretation of today's planetary crisis, and an emphasis on the intersection of race, class, and gender in capitalism's environmental history. According to Jason Moore, one of the most prominent voices within the world ecology paradigm, the perspective is distinguished by its reinterpretation of capitalism as embedded in what he refers to as, as he explains and complains. While it is now commonplace to invoke quite properly system change, not climate change, we should take care with how we think that system. A critique of capitalism that accepts its self-definition as a market or social system abstracted from the web of life is unlikely to guide us helpfully towards sustainability and liberation. We should be therefore wary of views of capitalism reduced to their economic and social moments, the practice of human exceptionalism. Exceptionalisms are always dangerous, especially so when it comes to humanity, a real abstraction active in a long history of racialized, gendered, and colonial violence. The world ecology perspective, by contrast, is committed to the view that capitalism develops through the web of life. As such, in Moore's words, in this movement, human sociality has been brutally reshaped through the separation between nature and society as real abstractions, enabling modernity's successive racialized and gendered orders. Mm. Moore's framework and understanding of modern capitalism is highly indebted to the world system theory first proposed by Emanuel Wallerstein. But Moore's approach goes beyond the work of Wallerstein insofar as he argues that to take capitalism seriously requires understanding that it is not just an economic system, but a way of organizing the relations between humans and the rest of the web of life on Earth. Indeed, as Moore puts it in a book with Raj Patel, capitalism is not just part of an ecology, but is an ecology, a set of relationships integrating power, capital, and nature. The world ecological approach thus seeks to interpret the dynamics of capitalism as a danger for what they refer to as the web of life. The basic trouble being that capital supposes infinite expansion within a finite web of life. At the core of Moore's argument is the importance of the dichotomous split between nature and society, a split they associate with the rise of capitalism. In their words, if profit was to govern life, a significant intellectual state shift had to occur, a conceptual split between nature and society. Moreover, Moore goes on to relate this conceptual split to the process of subjugation of women, indigenous peoples, slaves, and colonized peoples. For according to Moore, the rise of capitalism gave us the idea not only that society was relatively independent of the web of life, but also that most women, indigenous peoples, slaves, and colonized peoples everywhere were not fully human and thus not full members of society. These were people who were not or were only barely human. They were part of nature, 
treated as social outcasts. They were cheapened. What's more, more continues, the cleavings of nature from society, of savage from civilized, set the stage for the creation of other cheap things. Capitalism's practices of cheap nature would define whose lives and whose work mattered and whose did not. Its dominant ideas in nature and society, in uppercase because of their mythic and bloody power, would determine whose work was valued and whose work, care for young and old, for the sick and those with special needs, agricultural work and the work of extra human natures, animals, soils, forests, fuels, was rendered largely invisible. The world ecological approach espoused by Moore thus brings into focus how the dynamics of domination of nature by humans is systematically related to the domination of humans by humans. Moore seeks to show how relations of power, production, and reproduction work through the web of life, always stressing that the modern world's violent and exploitative relationships are rooted in five centuries of capitalism. The world ecological approach advanced by Moore also emphasizes the ubiquity of violence and bloodshed. In his words, world ecology allows us to see how concepts we take for granted, like nature and society, are problems not just because they obscure actual life and history, but because they emerged out of the violence of colonial and capitalist practice. These master concepts were not only formed in close relation to the dispossession of peasants in the colonies and in Europe, but also themselves used as instruments of dispossession and genocide. The nature society split was fundamental to a new modern cosmology in which space was flat, time was linear, and nature was external. That we are usually unaware of this bloody history, one that includes the early modern expulsions of most women, indigenous peoples, and Africans from humanity, is testimony to modernity's extraordinary capacity to make us forget. In his long and eloquent two-part essay, the Capitalist Scene, Part 1, on the nature and origins of our ecological crisis, and Part 2, Accumulation by Appropriation and the centri Centrality of Unpaid Work slash Energy, Moore further elaborates and articulates this argument in considerable depth, making the case for the centrality of historical thinking in coming to grips with capitalism's planetary crises of the 21st century. He criticizes the discourse of the Anthropocene for being shallow in its historicization and insists upon naming the climate crisis instead of the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, which he understands as a system of power, profit, and reproduction in the web of life. In the first part of the essay, Moore sets out to accomplish two tasks. The first is to situate the Anthropocene discourse within Green Thought's uneasy relationship to the human nature binary and its reluctance to consider human organizations like capitalism as part of nature. According to Moore, recognizing humans as part of nature while separating humanity from nature troubles Anthropocene thinking at every turn. Along such lines, Moore denounces, in the dominant Anthropocene presentation, the human species becomes a mighty, largely homogenous acting unit, the human enterprise. He goes on to ask, could a more neoliberal turn of phrase be found? This before continuing, inequality, commodification, imperialism, and pa patriarchy, racism, and much more, all have been cleansed from humanity, the Anthropocene's point of departure. Anthropocene discourse, more contends, tends to view humanity, or human societies in the abstract, as responsible for the transgression of planetary thresholds. Such a view, more insists, relies upon a dualistic notion of binary dividing humans from nature. But this kind of binary, more argues, obscures our vistas of power, production, and profit in the web of life. It prevents us from seeing the accumulation of capital as a powerful web of interspecies dependencies. It prevents us from seeing how those interdependencies are not only shaped by capital, but also shape it. And it prevents us from seeing how the terms of that producer product relation change over time. According to Moore, Anthropocene discourse in this respect tends to reflect and reify the very premises and assumptions of capitalism. For indeed, Moore contends, capitalism is premised on the separation of humanity and nature. Moreover, this separation has been inscribed with violence from the start. Moore insists, one moment was the expulsion of many humans from their homes during the rise of capitalism and many times thereafter. This provided a material condition for seeing nature as external, as nature. Another was the expulsion of many humans, probably the majority within the orbit of early capitalist power from humanity. Furthermore, he continues, this era of primitive accumulation gave rise not only to the accumulation of capital and the accumulation of men, but also a new world praxis, cheap nature. In sum, for more, the rise of capitalism thus, be, thus came with a new ontology of society and nature, one that assigns value to some work and some lives 
while excluding the vast majority. The separation between humanity and nature proved not only analytically, but also practically violent in enabling capitalism's world historical praxis, a praxis of cheapening the lives and work of many humans and most non-human natures. And indeed, capitalism's governing conceit is that it may do with nature as it pleases, that nature is external and may be fragmented, quantified and rationalized to serve economic growth, social development, or some other higher good. Anthropocene discourse, however, tends to ignore the fact that humans in produce intraspecies differentiations, which are ontologically fundamental to our species being, inequalities of class, especially, inflected by all manner of gendered and racialized cosmologies. What is needed to correct such tendencies, Moore argues, is a mode of analysis at once deeply historical and deeply reflexive, one that recognizes how our guiding concepts contest and correspond with capitalism's governing abstractions. The world ecological paradigm provides just such a perspective. Its point of departure, as summarized by Moore, world ecology emphasizes the rise of capitalism as a new way of organizing nature, organizing new relations between work, reproduction, and the conditions of life. That way is a two-way street. Capitalism is co-produced by and within the web of life at every turn. Manifold extra-human natures, diseases, soils, new crops like maize and the potato, drought animals, were active participants in the new ontological formation. Markets, class struggle, states, and empires are still important, hugely important in this frame. This alternative allows us to start looking at how every state, class, and colonial project, every revolt and strike, and every movement and accumulation of money has been bundled with extra human nature. The second main line of argument that Moore advances in the first part of his, of his two-part essay is a critique of the Anthropocene's dominant periodization, which meets up with a longstanding environmentalist argument about the Industrial Revolution as the origin of ecological crisis. Such a periodization, Moore contends, ignores early capitalism's environment-making revolution, greater than any watershed since the rise of agriculture in the first cities. This is not to say that Moore downplays the significance of the Industrial Revolution. He does not. He simply insists, while there is no question that environmental change accelerated sharply after 1850, and especially after 1945, it seems equally fruitless to explain these transformations without identifying how they fit into patterns of power, capital, and nature established four centuries earlier. Moore's alternative periodization thus stretches back close to 600 years, all the way back to 1450. He writes, between 1450 and 1750, a new era of human relations in the web of life begins, the age of capital. Likewise, he insists, if we wish to explain the origins and development of capitalism as world ecology, crucial to understanding the politics of the 21st century, we need a conversation over the ways that relations of power, capital, and nature crystallize in the centuries after 1450. One of the main features of this new crystallization was a landscape revolution. With the onset of the age of capital, more contends, over the course of the so-called long 16th century, a radical shift in the scale, speed, and scope of landscape change occurred. Meanwhile, the landscape revolution was accompanied by a revolution in productivity, as well as a revolution in techniques of appropriation. Moore explains, alongside new technologies, there was a new technics, a new repertoire of science, power, and machinery that aimed at discovering and appropriating new cheap natures. With primitive accumulation came the origins of cheap nature as an accumulation strategy. In sum, for Moore, the early modern landscape revolution represented an early modern revolution in labor productivity. He insists that this revolution in the zone of commodification was rendered possible by a revolution in the techniques of appropriating cheap natures, especially the four cheaps of food, labor, energy, and raw materials. Moreover, and crucially, this was realized not only through the immediate practices and structures of European imperialism. More fundamentally, the new imperialism of early modernity was impossible without a new way of seeing and ordering reality. Moore highlights the importance of the conquest of the new world in this regard, which not only marked a vast appropriation of potentially cheap nature, but of the labor power to transform it into capital. To this end, he quotes Enrique Dussel, for, for whom this was the fundamental structure of, of, of the first modernity. He furthermore stresses that the fact that early capitalism relied on global expansion as the principal means of advancing labor productivity and facilitating world accumulation reveals the remarkable precocity of early capitalism not its pre-modern character. Moore thus identifies three revolutions that took place over the course of the long 16th century. Revolutions of landscape change, 
of labor productivity and the techniques of global appropriation. By relating these three revolutions to one another, more suggests, we come upon a way of thinking capitalist crisis world ecologically, which for more means putting nature at the center of thinking about work, putting work at the center of our thinking about nature, and setting aside the presumption that human organization of any kind, from family forms to transnational corporations, can be adequately understood abstracted from the web of life. More chastises Anthropocene discourse, that is, arguments about global crisis under the sign of the Anthropocene, for having simultaneously embraced a strong narrative of, on the origins of ecological crisis and evaded the historical work necessary to excavate those origins. He elaborates a narrative which emphasizes not the Industrial Revolution as the point of origin of the current crisis, but rather the emergence of new relations of power, profit, and reproduction from the, from the long 16th century. Moore is even willing to recognize that his own periodization is not beyond plausible contention. In fact, he appeals to the idea that multiple periodizations need not be viewed as mutually exclusive. To this end, he highlights the value of Andreas Malm's important study of 19th century fossil capital, which of course entails a different periodization. Yet he adds, the error is to see these periodizations as mutually exclusive. Fossil capital, he asks, to which he replies, that is surely a crucial dimension of our reality since the 19th century. Capital, power, and nature entwine. However, he continues, just as we live in the era of fossil capital, do we not also live in the era of agrarian capitalism, characterized by punctuated revolutions and class struggle, nature, and the productive forces so necessary to the expanded reproduction of labor power? So too, he asks, are not these different interpretations premised on distinctive angles of vision? Is not the story of fossil capital one among several narratives necessary to grasp the history of capitalism and its present crisis? From there, he concludes, surely we are dealing with a massive reinvention of capitalism in the 19th century. So too, but under very different conditions after World War II, after 1971, and today. The capitalist scene and the centrality of unpaid work slash energy. Which brings us to the second part of Moore's essay on the capitalist scene, accumulation by appropriation and the centrality of unpaid work slash energy. In this part of the essay, Moore seeks to reconceptualize the past five centuries or the age of capital as the capitalist scene. To do so, he makes two interconnected arguments. The first of these draws on the work of the Bielefeld School Marxist feminist scholar, Maria Mies and her colleagues, who have contended that and sought to empirically demonstrate how the exploitation of labor power depends on a more expansive process, the appropriation of unpaid work slash energy delivered by women, nature, and colonies. Moore follows Mies in arguing that even if the paid work of some humans remains the economic pivot of capital, socially necessary labor time, it is nevertheless the case that its necessary conditions of reproduction are found in the unpaid work of women, nature, and colonies. Indeed, according to Moore and Mies, capitalism thrives when islands of commodity production and exchange can appropriate oceans of potentially cheap natures outside the circuit of capital, but essential to its operation. Elsewhere, he puts the point even more bluntly. He writes, the condition of some work being valued is that mo most work is not. He claims here again that his theoretical inspiration on this crucial point is to be found in the extraordinary Marxist feminist tradition. According to Moore, only now is the potential of this critique becoming apparent. This because it points towards a conception of value relations as co-produced through exploitation, capital labor, and appropriation, capital unpaid work. Moore continues by emphasizing, cheap nature is formed through the, the relations of paid and unpaid work and the knowledge practices necessary to identify and appropriate. It. He then goes on to conclude, unifying the historical entanglements of human and extra-human activity work, in, work inside and outside the circuit of capital may well prove useful in developing effective analytics and emancipatory politics as modernity unravels today. The second main argument that Moore advances in his second part of the essay has to do with the functioning of what he dubs the state capital science complexes. Accumulation by appropriation, he contends, turns on the capacity of such complexes to make nature legible. In this vein, Moore highlights the importance of two epic-making interventions inventions that took place in the long 16th century. One was what he dubs, following the eminent decolonial theorist Walter Mignolo, the invention of the new world. Moore emphasizes that this invention begins not with the invasion of the Americas, but with the colonization and conquest of the Atlantic islands and completion of the Reconquista, Reconquista in the half century before 1492. 
This amounted to a new form of conquest premised on new technologies of distance, beginning with the new cartography, portalon charts, and shipbuilding, caravels. Moreover, according to Moore, the second epic-making invention was that of a progressively rationalized cost-profit calculus. Here Moore follows Schupeter in emphasizing the role of double-entry bookkeeping, which like the mechanical clock, was invented in the late 13th century, becoming two centuries later an expressive moment of a calculative revolution that reshaped the world. Moore admits that it, its directly causal role in the rise of capitalism is open to debate, but he nevertheless insists that double entry bookkeeping, both as a practice and as a wider epistemic mode, was unquestionably important in this calculative revolution. Indeed, he points out double entry bookkeeping, its rapid diffusion from the, its, North, its North Italian hearth, dates from, not coincidentally, the 1490s. He furthermore points out that the, that diffusion carried the accounting system to the Andes after 1531, where it was among the key elements of Spanish civil administration and ecclesiastical practice. Moore goes on to argue for the existence of a dialectical interdependence between the logic of accumulation by expanded reproduction of commodities based on abstract social labor on the one hand, and the logic of accumulation by appropriation of unpaid work and energy based on abstract social nature on the other. According to Moore, if the substance of abstract social labor is time, the substance of abstract social nature is space, he continues. While managerial procedures within commodity production aim to maximize productivity per quantum of labor time, the geomanagerial capacities of states and empires identify and seek to maximize unpaid work slash energy per unit of abstract nature. Historically, he argues, successive state capital science complexes co-produce cheap natures that are located or reprodu reproduce themselves largely outside the cash nexus. Furthermore, he insists, geomanagerialism's preliminary forms emerged rapidly during the rise of capitalism. Its chief historical expressions comprise those processes through which capitalists and state machineries map, identify, quantify, and otherwise make natures legible to capital. And from this analysis, he goes on to conclude that in the present, a radical politics of sustainability must recognize and seek to mobilize through a tripartite division of work under capitalism, labor power, unpaid human work, and the work of nature as a whole. Moore confronts the argument that this centering of capitalism as the cause of climate catastrophe elides the experience of communist projects, which had less than a great track record when it comes to environmental sustainability in their own right, to say the least. Moore responds by arguing that his framework of the capitalist scene is a dialectical, not generalizing claim. As such, he contends, in contrast to positivist generalization, dialectical arguments proceed through, not in spite of, variation. What does he mean by this? He explains, the capitalist scene names a historical process in Marx's sense of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, as a general law constituted through counteracting tendencies. From this, he goes on to claim, to what degree either the Soviet or Chinese projects represented a fundamental break with previous ways of capitalist environment making is an important question, but beside the point. Indeed, for more, the question is whether or not such partial moments overwhelm the developing tendencies of history reproduced through the long array of the capitalist world ecology. And with that, we shall take a break. <laughs>